Good evening, this is Wednesday Night Bible Study, Matthew chapter number 4. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter number 4. So in the uh, uh, advent here of Jesus Christ and his earthly ministry, he begins, uh, obviously, his ministry with a message. You can't go out and do something without a message, and his message is something that is uh, very uh, familiar, in that if you've been reading through the book of Matthew, you've already seen it once. That is, the message mirrors the message of John the Baptist. So they preach the same message, uh, the same exact message, really, and uh, the only difference is that the one that is to come, the one that is to be named, has been named, right? And so the emphasis then is on him, that is on Christ, and the emphasis is on his kingdom that he is going to establish, and his kingdom that he is going to uh, set up and build and take from the other kingdoms of this world and make them his own. So, as we were looking through the book of Matthew, in chapter number uh, 4, and verse number 14, <clears throat> we read that what takes place is a fulfillment of prophecy. Everything that Jesus Christ has to do is, uh, is, is ha he has to fulfill prophecy. That means he has to fulfill what God has spoken in, in times past by the mouth of the prophets. So when he writes in verse number 14, that might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. That is, again, just testament to the validity of the word of God. It's testament to the truth of God's word. And when you see where it says there, the land of Zabulon and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness, okay, and we said that they sat in darkness, that is, the nation of Israel sat in darkness, especially those in Galilee of the Gentiles, they sat in darkness because what? They're like sheep without a what? They're like sheep without a shepherd, right? They're like people without a pastor. They don't know what they're supposed to do because they've been led into darkness. They've been led into what? When you look at the word darkness, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's always a parallel to what? It's a parallel to understanding. It's a parallel to knowledge. And so when you see something, what do you do with your eyes? You can see with your eyes, you comprehend with your brain, and what can it do? It can give you knowledge. So when the people sit in darkness, when they see the great light, they see the fulfillment of the word of God in which they do what? In which they believe, in which they exercise faith in. So when the people which sat in darkness, they saw the great light, that great light is who? Who is the light? It's Jesus Christ, right? That light arises, the light gives knowledge, the light uh, 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 reproves, the light rebukes. Uh, John chapter number 3, men love darkness rather than light because they're what? Because their deeds are evil. So what we're going to see today is that in the beginning of Jesus Christ's ministry, he uses the word repent. And a lot of people get hung up on that word and they don't know what to do with it. Oh, repent, repent, repent. It's such a weird word. What do we do with it? How do we work it? It's, it's really not that complicated, nor, is it, nor does it really need to be an issue where you're worried whether or not you truly repented. And so if you go through history, uh, you will see that many people have taken the assurance of salvation from another because they have stated you have not truly repented, right? Well, the truth is repentance is probably not what most people are thinking repentance is. And also, repentance has a, a usage that we'll see today in about three or four different ways, okay? So when he says here, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, it's important because that great light is Jesus Christ, and he says, and to them which sat in the region of the shadow of death, what happens? Light is sprung up. So light arises out of that. That's why Jesus Christ came out of that area so that it could be said that he came out of there, that the light came from this area. And then from that time, what did he do? He gave the information that is part of the light. If he just shows up and he doesn't say anything, is that going to give any people any light? No, right? What does he have to do? He has to open his mouth and he has to tell the people the following. He says that. He says in verse 17, from that time, Jesus began to what? Preach. And so preaching is something that is, is again, uh, foolishness to most of the people today. People don't like preaching, and they really didn't like the preaching of Jesus Christ unless what? Unless they wanted to receive it. So we'll talk about the reception issue in a little bit with the people of Israel, the nation versus the, uh, you know, the a nation of unbelievers versus uh, the, the, the wicked and adulterous generation. So when you see here, he says, from that time, Jesus began to preach. Sorry, can somebody get the dogs? Who's, who's barking over there? Bailey? Hey, Bailey, can you be quiet, please? Buddy. So uh, whenever the dogs bark, I have like a, my mind goes into like a little maze and I can't figure out where I'm going. So if the thing's open, you can just shut the blinds. So, all right. 
so you get to hear this. This is real world here. We're doing this live here. We're doing a real, real world Bible study in a home with two dogs who love to bark at any possible animal that goes by. So, all right. So when he says here, for that time, Jesus began to preach, the message of Jesus Christ is a message that has already been preached. So what is what is people what do people like to do when you preach? Preaching is something that you should what already know, right? So the preaching here is the preaching of the message of John the Baptist, okay? So when you look at Matthew chapter uh, 3 in verse number 1, remember what he says there, in those days came John the Baptist preaching. Again, same thing that Jesus Christ is doing. They're preaching, and they're preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying what? Repent ye, okay? Repent ye, then a colon. And then the reason why you're going to repent, the reason why you're going to repent is what comes after the colon, right? That word for, right? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, why should I repent? That's the, that's the question. The answer is for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> Repentance is an understanding that results from illumination that effectuates a change of mind. I'll say that again. That's based upon this text here repentance, right? So these people are, they sat in darkness, they see a great light, and now they're going to repent, right? They're, they came, the, the shadow of death, the light sprung up, now they're going to see the light, and what are they going to do? Well, they have an understanding now, because Jesus Christ is preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and this illumination that they have effectuates in a change of mind. So understanding that results from illumination that effectuates a change of mind, okay? So, the reason why these people are going to repent is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when it is at hand, that means it's ready to go. It's ready to be established. Okay? It's there. It's, it's right there in the midst of them. Okay? So when he says repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, I want to make it very clear that the reason why they're going to repent and what they're going to repent of is, yes, they're going to repent of sin. No doubt. Right? Are they going to repent of sin? Yeah. Sure. But go back to Matthew 3. You can see over here in Matthew chapter number 3, he says, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, so the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Does that tell you any reasons why they would be out there baptizing and confessing their sin? Right? Well, no, what would that mean? The reason why they're confessing their sin is the, is the call to repentance. It's the call to telling them to repent, calling them to change their mind. And saying, this action, this behavior that you're doing is unacceptable. And the reason why you should do this and listen is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what accompanies the kingdom? What directly precedes the kingdom? Judgment. Okay? And what and who does judgment come upon? It comes upon sin. It comes upon the disobedient. Correct? So, what God is trying to do here through Christ is trying to do the same thing that he's trying to do with John the Baptist. That is, prepare the people, right? He says in verse number uh, 3, 3 of chapter Matthew, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight, right? So, the, the, the idea is that if you're straight edge, when I was growing up in the fundamental circles, oh man, you're real straight edge. You ever heard somebody say that before? You're real straight edge. And then I had a friend who created a band in high school. You could probably look them up, Google them. It's called Crooked Edge. And they created the band called Crooked Edge just because they didn't want to be so straight edge, you know? They want to take the crooked way. And, and so straight implies the right way. It implies the correct way. And so this straight path says make his path straight. It's like, you know, do what's supposed to be done and so that you can prepare that way so that when he comes, he doesn't have to do what? He doesn't have to smite the earth with a curse, Malachi chapter number 4, right? So we looked at some of those passages. So really, there is a, a people that he's trying to prepare for the Lord. It's not just you know uh, uh, that he wants them just to, to confess their sin. He wants them to be prepared. And the reason why is this. Does sin prevent service? Yes. Can sin prevent belief? Yes. Look at Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, sin can prevent belief. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 21 in verse number um, 23. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, 
I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, in which we're going to look in a second, was repentance, right? For the what? For the remission of sins. So the baptism of John, which was the baptism of repentance, saying that they should believe on him who is to come after, and they were to do what also? They were to confess their sins in the Jordan. And he says, the baptism of John, whence was it? Meaning, did it come from John, or was this something that God had ordained? That is, he was a prophet. Is it from heaven or of men? And they reason with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. There's that distinction. The distinction between who? The wicked and adulterous generation and who? The, the generation of vipers and the unbelieving Israel portion, right? The, 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 the lost sheep. Verse 27, they lie and say, and they answer Jesus and said, we cannot tell. And he said unto them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Verse 28, but what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he did what? He repented and went. So what came first? The change of mind that does what? Results in the change of what? Eventually the change in action. So if he went and did, you would result, if he, if he said, he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented. Well, what did he repent? He changed his mind, right? He decided, yeah, okay, I'm going to go do it. I will not. Now, okay, I will, right? And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, and sir, I go, sir, and went not. He says, whether of them twain did the will of his father. Well, look what he says. They say unto him the first, of course, because he said he was going to, or said he didn't want to, and then he repented, then he actually went and did. He didn't lie about it and say that he was going to go and not go. So he says this, Verily I say unto you that publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Now, a lot of people will say, is that mean that they're going to go, that, that these people get to go into the kingdom of God? No, I think what it's saying is that the king, the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before them, not that they're going to get to go. Does that make sense? It's just they're going to go before them. That is, it's going to visually happen in front of them. Not in, not, in, not, this isn't talking about order, Right? Before you, as in it happens, you go first and they come second, because these guys don't go. As you can read here in verse number 32, he says, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness. What was his righteousness called? Well, not sinning, confessing your sin, being righteous, even as your Father which in heaven is righteous, right? And he says, And ye believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, so when you saw the publicans, when you saw the harlots, when you saw John come in the way of righteousness, what did you not do? You did not repent afterwards that ye might believe him. So what happened? What, 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 look, read the, read the context here. When he says, you repented not afterwards that ye might believe him, what's preventing the belief, right? The fact that you need any repentance at all. He's saying, you don't need any repentance. You repent the night after that ye might believe him. So sin does what? Sin pre prevents uh, belief. And so what does sin also prevent? As I said, sin prevents service. See, if, you, if I tell you, look, hey, you know what? You're a sinner. And somebody says, no, I'm not. Well, guess what? That's the first step in understanding whether or not you can be justified. Is coming to grips that you're ungodly, right? Isn't that how it works? Yeah. Changing your mind about your self-righteousness. That's what these guys needed to do. They need to change their mind about their self-righteousness, about their works, and that those were actually sin. And they looked at the publicans and the harlots and said the same thing as they do over there in the end of the book of Luke. And they said, we thank thee, God, that we're not like this publican, right? The sinners, the extortioners, the unjust, they thought themselves to be just. They thought they needed no repentance. So when he says here, when ye had seen it, you repented not afterwards that ye might believe him, that sin that prevents belief will also prevent what? Service. Why? Because you don't believe, why would you do service? So look at the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter number 2, and verse number 21. Actually, let's go up to verse number 19. Look what he says. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. Okay? So what he's saying now is he's talking about uh, those who have the seal, which is the seal of 
the Holy Spirit, right? And he says, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Okay, he knows those individuals who have believed, who, has, who have not believed. He knows those individuals who will possess the Holy Spirit and who do not. And he says, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ do what from iniquity? Depart from it, right? Depart from iniquity. How are you going to depart from it? What does that mean to depart from it? Well, look what he writes. He says, but in a great house, okay, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. So what he's explaining is like, look, even in the body of Christ, there's what? There are some serious problems. These guys are out there doing things that are dishonoring. He says some to honor and some to dishonor. Verse 21, how can we depart from iniquity? How can one uh, not be uh, one of dishonor? He says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, from what? From iniquity, from the dishonor. He says, he shall be a vessel, and a vessel does what? It carries, a vessel is used to transport. He says, a vessel unto honor. Sanctified, that means to be set apart. And meat, that is, it's ready to go. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's now the acceptable time, he says. And meat for the, whose use? Master's use. And so the master's use is not sin, right? Is, is, is God the minister of sin? No. Who does the sin? Your flesh does. If we seek to be justified, right, by faith, and we sin, what does Paul say? Does that make Christ the minister of sin? No. So he says it's prepared unto every good work. So what happens is that the, 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 the sin prevents belief, and then sin prevents the service. So these people pre prepared for the master's use is exactly what God is trying to do through John the Baptist, and he's reiterating it through the preaching of Jesus Christ. He's telling them, look, how can you go out and tell all the nations of the earth about the law of Moses? How can you go out and tell all the nations and instruct them in the way of righteousness when you yourselves don't practice righteousness? Is anybody going to listen to you? Probably not. What's the biggest detriment to a believer today in terms of their ministry? When somebody would say, oh, I have no clue. I would have never thought you were a Christian, right? Well, great. That's not a good thing, you know? It can be a good thing in terms of uh, if, they're, if you're super, you know, legalistic or religious. But most of the time people will say because you're not exemplifying good works, it's because you're not having a difference that is seen in terms of your ministry, in terms of your service. So from the time that Jesus begun his ministry, from the very beginning, he preached. And he preaches and he preaches and he preaches. And he's, we're going to see that he preaches and teaches all throughout the synagogues. And the thing that he always preaches, now he teaches there in the synagogues, but he also preaches. And what he always preaches is the kingdom of heaven. And in particular, he, he preaches the gospel. Okay, If you look at... Uh, Verse number 23 of Matthew 4, he says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then what follows all that is the signs, the wonders, the miracles, all those things that the prophets have spoken, which, which will uh, obviously signify that the kingdom really is here, and that the man, Christ Jesus, is the Son of Man, that he's going to actually happen. Okay? So look over at the book of Mark, and let's look at this word repentance used here and what is also accompanies with it. So as I said, sin prevents unbelief, or sin prevents belief, sin creates unbelief. In Mark chapter number 1, and verse number 15, we see exactly what Jesus Christ says, okay? John, Mark 1, 15, 14, it says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and saying the following. Look at this. The time is fulfilled. What time is fulfilled? Whenever you see that, you've got to realize, look, he's talking about something that he's got a timetable in his head, right? Jesus Christ has a timetable. In his mind, he's thinking the time is fulfilled. How many people today have no clue about the timetable of God? They, could, they, they have no clue what the timetable of God is. And so when Jesus Christ says the time is fulfilled, you can look at that Isaiah 60 and Isaiah 61, especially in verse number 2, where the acceptable year of the Lord is, is happening, and Jesus Christ comes out and does his ministry, and he says the time is fulfilled, and look what he says, and the kingdom of God is at hand, 
because that's a prophesied event, right? Repent ye, and then he puts this additional issue on there, and do what? Repent ye and believe the gospel, okay? So now the question becomes this. Is repentance belief and is belief repentance? Well, sometimes repentance is belief and sometimes belief is repentance. Repentance is not a work. So let's make that very clear. So that when you repent, that is you change your mind, it does result in works. It can result in works, right? Can you change your mind but then not do the works that follow? Sure, right? It's absolutely possible. Now, is that the will of God for you to do that? No. You say, oh, that's sin, but you don't stop it. You say that's sin, but oh, I'm not, whatever it is. Oh, I need to go do that, but I'm not going to. You change your mind about it, but it doesn't result in the action. The action is the work that repentance is not. So he says, repent ye and believe the gospel. He's giving them a command to exercise faith. And in particular, the faith is in the gospel. What, what, believe the gospel? What gospel? Well, as we can see here that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that's the gospel. Throughout all the scripture, especially in the New Testament, you can read about people who, like uh, Joseph of Arimathea, right? He waited for what? He rated for the consolation of Israel. Other people like uh, Anna and, and, and Zacharias and these other guys, they waited for redemption. They waited for hope. They, uh, you can look, and, and those two on the road to Emmaus, right? Uh, we talked, it was probably Cleopas and, 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 and his wife that were on the road to Emmaus. And those two individuals, they did what? They said, oh, we thought it was going to be he that was going to redeem Israel. So these people had in their mind a good news message about the redemption of the nation of Israel that was going to take place because God had promised that it was going to occur. So let me give you a verse that really helps give you all the different various usages and forms and types of the word repentance. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, it's a good verse that goes through it, okay? And then I want to give you another verse over in 2 Corinthians uh, 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, look at this. So, so uh, he, he, he's talking about his boldness of speech toward him. He says, look, w- when I did this, I'm not doing it for our, my, my own sake. I'm doing it for your sake. I'm trying to help you out. And he says, for though I made you sorry with a letter, okay, I do not repent. Okay, so let's figure this out. He says, for, I, for though I made you sorry with a letter. So he wrote a letter to the Corinthians and did it make somebody sad? Yeah, when you get a demerit or you get a detention at school and they write up there, right, and you did really bad stuff, I mean, do you feel sad about it? Well, yeah, right? You're sad. Oh, I'm sad that I did that because what? You got called out. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Now, is there any sin that the Apostle Paul did in writing that letter? No, that letter was good. Now, what does he say? I do not repent. Why? He says, I made you sorry with the letter, but I do not repent because there's nothing that I was to repent of. What I did was correct. I didn't need to change my mind. I was not sorrowful. Look what he did. Though I did repent. So how can he say, I do not repent, though I did repent? How can somebody say, no, I, I, did, I do not repent, though I did repent, right? How does that work? Well, what does he do? He's not, he's not going to change his mind about what happened, but he's what? He's like, I was sorrowful. I was sorrowful at what happened. I was not, you know, happy with the circumstances of as how this worked in terms of your lack of sanctification. He says, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. So when he wrote it, they were sorrowful in the reproof of their sin. He says, now I rejoice. Wow, So, but he was repenting, remember? So I do not repent, though I did repent. So he was sorrowful. But then he says, now I rejoice. Not that ye were made sorry. So you see how he's saying about repentance and sorrow? Were they sorrowful? Yes. But look what he says. Now rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed. So what happened before the repentance? You sorrowed to repentance. You sorrowed to a point in which you said, what? Yeah, that is not acceptable. And it resulted in a change of mind. Look what he says in verse 9 again. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner. That is illumination, understanding that comes by the word of God that effectuated a change of mind. 
And when they saw that, he says, But that you sorrowed to repentance... For you're made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us nothing. He says, what I wrote you, at first you said, what? I'm sorrowful and it hurt you. Then as the time went on and you processed that information, it worked into a godly sorrow that worked itself out into a repentance, into an understanding, right? So you have that change of mind that then results in ultimately the, the works, the change of action. He says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to what? To salvation this, or, or deliverance from what? From the bondage, from that captivity of the sin, the bad doctrine, etc. He's not talking about for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation to eternal life, right? You follow me? Anytime you read the word salvation, all people think about it. Saved, saved, are you saved, 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 are you saved, saved. I mean, how many people say that word all the time? right? It's talking about salvation and deliverance there. And he says, not to be repented of. Wow, this, you see how many times this word repent is used? I mean, it's one, two, three, four, five. It's been five times already. And it's, I mean, it's pretty intense here, all the different variations of how it's being used. But he says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. That is, it works itself out into a change of mind in which actually can help you and he says, not to be repented of. Isn't that crazy? That you, you, you repent to salvation, not to be repented of. Not to change your mind again of. Not to change your thinking again of. But to keep that my, method of thinking about the original godly sorrow that worked to that godly repentance. And he says, but the sorrow of the world, what does it do? Look, they can sorrow and they can sorrow and they can sorrow and they sorrow. But what do they not have? They have no hope. They get no, they get no like, hey, these guys are going to sorrow to the godly sword, which then works in salvation and deliverance from the sin because they go, wow, I'm not longer in the bondage of sin. But to everybody else who lives their life in fear of the bondage of death, what happens to them? They can sorrow and it just works out to death. Isn't that crazy? They have, they get no illumination. They can be sorrow. They can be sorry. They can be sorry. They can sorrow. At the end of the day, it doesn't help them at all. Now, when he says down here, and I love what he says in verse 11, one of my favorite verses, he says, for behold, this self same thing. He's like, look what happens. That ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourself. See, what did the repentance really bring out of them? Look at all this. Look what the change of mind brought out. The change of mind brought out actions. And he says, yea, what, what, yeah, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. I mean, look at all these actions. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Wow. And he says, there, Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that off, suffered wrong, but that our care might... Uh, care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you what? Love. You're loving the body, but you're also loving the babies in Christ. So when somebody says that we need to not, not speak against sin, because to speak against sin is none of your business. I mean, I was on a blog post this week, and somebody made a post about, again, about being gay. And I said, can we just, you know, can we, can we stop this whole thing? It's not like this is, this is, this has to be this whole gay train. Every time we have a post, it's got to be about gays and it's got to be about treating them with equality. We're going to treat all sinners with equality. You follow me? If you guys want true equality, let's treat everybody in the body of Christ with equality. Let's treat the fornicator and the adulterer and the luster and the deceiver and the wicked one the same way as we treat the gay one. And I gave the example of this, that if in the, in a body of Christ, in a church, if there was a member of the body of Christ who attended a local assembly who was an adulterer and was open about it, what would occur? You would hope that the body of Christ would say, hey, 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 no, 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 you can't be sleeping with so-and-so's wife. That's not going to fly here, okay? But when the gay or the homosexual comes in to the body and is a member of the body and is a member of the body of Christ and comes into the local assembly and says, let me be gay, right? What do we do? We disregard scripture. We do not love. We do not show equality. What do we do? We show preferential treatment to that individual and his sin. Wow. I mean, nobody thinks about it like that. Look, it's no different than any other sin, okay? It's the same thing. 
The reason why Christians are more vocal about it is because the more vocal the opposition gets, the more vocal Christianity should become against it. Absolutely. If they're going to say abortion is right, then a Christian should stand up and take a stand for righteousness and say, no, we're not going to kill babies. If homosexuals are going to say, no, we want to come into your church, not be repentant of any of our sin, and just live a lascivious lifestyle in which we're going to live contrary to the word of God, and you should accept that, let's make it very clear that that is not love. That's actually hate. When you leave a brother in sin, you hate your brother. That's how it is. I mean, I can't tell you probably, it's probably... Out of every 30 posts, five or six of them relate to gay marriage. Five or six of them relate to homosexuality, right? Look, yeah, it's a perversion. There's lots of them out there. So the equality is let's treat all sinners in the same way. Let them see the grace of God and help them, right? Hey, look what he says. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we were for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I'm not ashamed, but as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found in truth. And his inward affection, more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. I rejoice. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. Galatians 4.20 is a great verse to compare that to where he says, I stand in doubt of you, right? He stands in doubt of those in Galatia, and he's, over here he says, I have confidence in you in all things. It's pretty interesting how this all works, but if you go over to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 12, look what he writes here again. He's defending here in chapter number 12 his apostleship. He's defending what he's doing, right? And he says over in verse number, uh, uh, I love all these passages, but verse 12, he says, for Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it wherein you are inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. <laughs> it's pretty funny. The sarcasm's coming out. He's saying, Behold, the third time I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. So what's he saying? He's saying the parents, the children don't get all rich and pay the parents. He's their godly father. He's the one that has, has bore them in the spirit. And he says, you know what? I'm laying it all up for you, and I'm going to give it all to you free of charge. And he says, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. When you have a little kid, you'll spend as much money as you possibly can your little kid. You'll give him whatever you want. It doesn't matter. People are like, don't spoil your kid. It's impossible not to. You just love him so much. Like, what do you want? I will give you anything because you desire so much to see that child happy. You desire so much to see that child fulfilled. And so that's what Paul's seeing in these people. He's saying, I'm going to give you everything I have to be members of the body of Christ that are functional. And he says, the, uh, through, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. I love that. Read that again. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Wow. That, that could be a comparison between Christ and the church, you know? The more Christ loved them, the more, the more the church just says, eh. He says, but be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Look at this, verse 17. Did I make gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? Was I lining my pockets? Was I becoming profitable? I desired Titus, and with him I sent you a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? Verse 19, look at this. Again. Think ye that we accuse, excuse ourselves unto you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things dearly beloved for your edifying. Dude, the book of First and Second Corinthians is a spanking book to the nth degree. They're spanking books. I mean, there no, there's no like, oh, okay, guys, I know you want to sleep with your uh, your your father's mother, and uh, you know what? Why don't you just keep that down just a little bit? Don't, only do it on the weekends. Don't be so... No, what does he say? He says, deliver such an one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day. Whoa. I mean, that sounds like it's crazy. If you preach that in the church today, people would do what? If you, if you actually said, them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear, I literally posted this on the blog, and people said they 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 i love just posting verses and you can you have an option to upvote or downvote you can up the vote or you can down the vote 
and just watch all the downvotes you get just for quoting verses. And I'm like, God, I'm sorry that they just dismiss your word. But what's really funny is I get one or two private messages of somebody saying, dang, you're preaching it so hard and these people hate it. And I'm like, yeah, but it's so rewarding because it's like, this is what you need. Even though you don't want it, it's still so good for you. The guy said, you know, it's none of your business. You, sh- you don't have to be, you know, so uh, demeaning in how you say it. I said, hold on, let me ask you a question. Does the truth change based upon the delivery of the truth? Does it? Does the truth change based upon the delivery? No. What does change? The acceptance of the truth. But the truth is constant. And to that, many people don't like. Now, is there a method of, of, of presenting the gospel? Yes. Is there a method in presenting rebru- reproof and rebuke? Yes. But is there a point in time in which you put your foot down, you have a zeal, and you have a righteous indignation? Yeah, absolutely. Now, is, can somebody call you out and call you a sinner? Yep. But as we've all said, if only sinless people can rebuke, nobody can rebuke. Titus 2, right? So, Looking at what's happening there in Matthew chapter number four, the reason why he's so bent on getting these guys to repent and to and to live get their life cleaned up is because he tells them, just in a couple verses, he says, "Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven." The purpose is the teaching. The purpose is the instruction in which they say, "Look, here's how you do it. It's like this guy, right?" But what is it ultimately coming back to? Incapability incapability, 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 not possible, not possible, not possible. Be perfect even as your heaven, Father which is in heaven is perfect, is not possible. Look what he says in verse number 20 here. He says, for I fear, lest when I come, look at this. Now he's got a little bit of fear. So he was all excited. He's got confidence in him. And now he's getting back and he's remembering what's going on about this issue. And he says, for I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would and that I should be found unto you such as ye would not. Right? He goes, you're going to find me and I'm going to have the cat of nine tails. Remember what he says? What will ye? Remember that? Remember that verse? What, What will ye? Shall I come with, uh, you know, how am I going to come when I see you? Look what he says. For I fear lest when I shall come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I should find you, find unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates. What's, how funny is it that he gets the first thing he says is debates of anything? Because what is the debating issue? It's just that work of the flesh going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's crazy. He says, debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings. What what is this all about? This is about the body of Christ doing what? Fighting against itself, right? Don't hit yourself. Don't hit yourself. Don't hit yourself. Don't hit yourself. That's what the body of Christ is doing. That's what Paul's like, dude, stop hitting yourself. Dude, stop hitting yourself. You're making this thing a mess, right? It's It's like the left leg wants to run and the right leg just keeps kicking it to trip it, right? Getting in front of it, tripping it. All that type of stuff. And that's what happens with the body of Christ. He says, strifes, backbiting, whisperings, swellings, tumults. And he says, unless when I come again, what's he do? My God will humble me among you. So he humbles him and saying, wow, man, you know, I just see how how messed up, how messed up and sinful you guys really are. And look what he says. And then I shall bewail. So, you know, here's the thing. When people say, oh, just be super nice and just get your nice voice out here. No, there, there reaches a point in which what happens? You know, when your dad used to say, he'd be like, Jason, I want you to come over here, right? And you'd be like, no, nah, I don't want to come. He'd be like, I'm going to give you the count of three to get over here, right? I mean, please tell me somebody else's dad did that. And your dad'd be like, one. And there was that one time you're like, I ain't coming. Two three and you just sat there and you stared your dad in the face then my dad's like all right gets the belt off and i'm like oh no and then i come running and then my dad's like no it's too late we're getting a whipping now and what does he do he bewails many look what he does he bewails many which have sinned already and what's he say you're all going to hell no he doesn't say he's going to hell what is he saying he does everything for he does everything for the edification. so bewailing people because of their sin is edification yeah 
Novel thought, isn't it? Because why? Because sin is a cancer of the body of Christ. And it keeps going and growing and growing and growing and growing. And most people are perfectly content to live their life. I Honestly, I'm scared for the judgment seat of Christ for myself, let alone for some of my friends who are going to get there and it's going to be a fireworks show. And it's going to be like, dude, you have no freaking clue what's going to happen when the judge of the universe looks at you and is like, dude, you got nothing. You got nothing. Zero. This much? He says, I shall bewail many of you which sinned already and have not, look at this word, repented of uncleanness. So you can repent of uncleanness apparently, right? And you can repent of fornication and you can repent of lasciviousness, lasciviousness which they have committed, right? Wow. Not, not that hard, okay? Not that hard to see. So, you know, We've been going for 40 minutes, so the big word for, you know, why they're repenting is for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And with the kingdom comes judgment. Okay? Judgment starts where? Starts first with who? Starts first with Israel. Part of the reason of Jacob's trouble, of the tribulation, is, is because of Israel's sin, but also for the sin of the world. And during that time, it's another chance to purify the nation, to sanctify them of their uncleanness. And we'll see that the reason why God wants them to repent and believe the gospel is so that they can repent, believe the gospel, participate in the baptism of repentance for the remission of their sins. And the remission of their sins is so that their sins are not held against them. So that they can participate in the blessings that we're going to read about in Matthew chapter number 5. Blessed, 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 blessed. They can get those things, right? Remission. Not facing the punishment for sin. So that they can be a people. In Luke chapter 1 verse 17 says. Luke 1 17 says. So that they can be a people prepared for the Lord. Who he says. Luke 1 17. He says in verse 17, He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people, not just make the path straight, not just make his way straight, as we read in Matthew chapter 3, but also make a people prepared for the Lord. Meet, sanctified, ready for the master's use. Pretty straightforward to see, right? To do what? To do what is Isaiah chapter 42? They're going to do this. They're going to be, as he says here in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and will give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes. So what happens when you have understanding that results from illumination that effectuates a change of mind? You go out and do that to somebody else. So you open the blind eyes. You bring out the prisoners from the prison who have been held in bondage, who have been held in the uh, prisoners of death and bondage, as Hebrews 2.15 says, all the days of their life and you bring them out of that prison and you that sit in darkness and out of the prison of the house right and at the end of the day you do all that so that they can be converted and the nation of israel is to go out and, and preach that gospel message so we'll pick up next week on this uh and we'll we'll get more into uh what this gospel of the kingdom message includes why it's the time is fulfilled what is that time element and how does the time element get interrupted I mean, the time element is so stinking precise that unless you understand that there's an interruption called the dispensation of the grace of God, I do not understand what your Bible says. It doesn't make any sense. And that's how you mess up and you talk about replacement Israel. That's how you get into a spiritual Israel perceptive perception. That's how you get into a post-trib. That's how you get into a mid-trib position. That's how you get into all kinds of crazy positions when you do that. Okay? So let's close in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this time. Thank you.